come to your word, please would you speak to us. Please would you help us by your spirit to grasp what you're saying. And please would you change our hearts and lives and make them like yours, we pray, more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. One Corinthians chapter eight and the whole chapter. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For though, although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Now you'll remember back to Monday the 19th of July and Freedom Day for our nation. And on that day, nearly all the legal restrictions for the pandemic were lifted in this country. So we're now free to live as we wished, as we wish. We don't need to wear masks. We don't need to socially distance on a legal level and so on. And of course, many people um, use that freedom, exercise that right with gay abandon. Others don't though. So as we go about our daily business, many people still continue to wear masks. Many people continue to socially distance from others. And this can easily create a tension, even a division between people, between those who exercise their freedom and those who choose not to. So it would be easy for those who exercise their freedom to get annoyed or angry with those who don't. They could see them wearing masks and keeping their distance and get quite irate. Can't they see, they might reason, that there's no need to do these things anymore? Can't they see that they're spreading fear and living in bondage? 
but then it would be equally easy for people who uh, don't exercise their freedom to get annoyed and even angry with those who do. Can't they see, they might reason, that the pandemic is not over, the virus is still there, it's still posing a threat. Can't they see they're putting my health, even my life, at unnecessary risk by their cavalier attitude? And so tension, division can easily come. And I think this is especially true at this time when emotions are high, after months of frustration and fear, tempers can easily erupt, relationships can be torn apart. So the question we're thinking about this morning is how should we as Christians handle all of this? How should we live in the world and in the church? How can we, as we heard from Ephesians 4 last week, maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace? And making it very practical, should I wear a mask or not? Should I maintain my distance from others or not? Should I exercise the freedom the government has given to me or not? So these are the sorts of issues I want to address as we think about this chapter in 1 Corinthians 8. And maybe frustratingly, I'm not going to give a simple yes or no answer this morning. Because the Bible doesn't give a simple yes or no answer. What the Bible gives us is principles to apply. Principles that will apply differently in different situations. But these are principles that are so important and relevant for us at this time. Principles that we can apply with prayer and care and then principles which will help us to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So I want to zoom in this morning on just one phrase at the end of verse one, memorable phrase. It's a good one to sort of store up in your memory bank. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I rather like the way J.B. Phillips paraphrases. He says, we should remember that while knowledge may make a man look big, it is only love that can make him grow to his full stature. So, if you remember nothing else from this morning, here's the big message to remember. We are to prize love more than we are to prize knowledge. And our actions are to be guided by love more than they are guided by knowledge. So let's see how this works out. We're going to see how it works out for the Christians in first century Corinth, and then we're going to see and think about how it works out for us in 21st century Britain with our pandemic issues. So first of all, knowledge puffs up. Knowledge puffs up. Now, of course, we don't have the issue that face the Corinthian Christians. It, it's just not an issue. We don't go to Tesco or Sainsbury's and think, can I buy this or not? Um, was this offered to idols or not? Can I eat it or not? It's just not really an issue for us. But we do need to understand this issue because as we understand it, we will get at a principle that is really important for us that we can apply to our particular issues today. So thinking caps on, think yourself back into the first <coughs> century, into the, the city of Corinth, where sacrificing to pagan gods was just part of life. It was just everywhere, publicly, privately. It was just the culture 
It's what people did. I think the closest we might get to it today, if you're familiar with a Buddhist culture or a Hindu culture, that would probably be the closest we would get to this sort of culture. Maybe closer to home in Britain, um, New Age culture starts to, to hit some of these buttons. But just to give you an idea, if you lived in first century Corinth, and you were invited by a non-Christian friend for a meal, you would have faced this issue directly. Almost certainly, some of the food placed before you would have been offered to, uh, to an idol. It would have been burnt. And I don't mean burnt accidentally, as in overcooked like the children who commenting on their dad's cooking said they're summons to the meal table by the smoke alarm going off. <laughs> this was because the food was offered as a burnt offering to some pagan god or idol. And so there you are as a Christian, you have turned away from these worthless idols, you've turned to the living and true God and now you've got food placed before you, some of which has been offered in some religious ceremony to a pagan idol. So the question is, what do you do? Do you eat it or not? The same sort of thing was going on in the public sphere Priests would have offered the same sort of sacrifices to pagan gods in their temples. And some of this food from the sacrifice would have ended up in the marketplace. And the public could then buy it and eat it. So if you're a Christian, do you buy such food or not? Now it's clear that some Christians in first century Corinth clearly thought that you shouldn't. They considered such food spiritually polluted. They thought it would be sinful to eat it, that it would bring harm. Some even thought that demons had um, infested this food, that it was spiritually inhabited by demonic forces, and that the very process of eating it would be to ingest demonic forces into yourself. Now, in our passage, Paul describes this way of thinking as weak. It's weak in the sense that it is lacking in spiritual knowledge and understanding. So according to verse 4, he says, an idol has no real existence, and there's no God but one. So in other words, there's no significance in the food having been sacrificed to idols. It's not spiritually contaminated. It's not demon possessed in itself. It will do us no harm, apart from maybe from the carcinogenic properties of burnt food. And so in summary, he says, verse eight, according to knowledge, Food will not commend us to God. We're no worse off if we don't eat. We're no better off if we do. It's no issue in that sense. So if our actions are only determined by what we know, then we have complete freedom to eat the food. But Paul's whole point here is that knowledge is not the only thing we should be thinking about. In fact, it's not even the most important thing to consider. Knowledge in itself puffs up. That's not to say knowledge is bad. It's just to say it's not the only thing to think about. It's knowledge without love is the problem. Knowledge without love puffs up. It gives us 
um, a sense of superiority over others who don't possess the knowledge. And it can lead to real harm, even division, if we're not careful. So verse 7, we need to realize that not everyone possesses this knowledge. For them, to eat food which had been sacrificed to idols was like eating poison. To eat it was sin. It was to partake in pagan idolatry. It was to offend the Lord Jesus whom they worshipped and served. And so if I, who have knowledge, eat such food in the presence of someone else who doesn't have the knowledge, I need to think about what effect that's going to have on that person, that brother or sister. And just look at the effect Paul describes here. Verse 7, he says, it will cause their conscience to be defiled. Verse 10, it will encourage them to eat the food. Verse 11, this will harm them, not because the food in itself is harmful, but because they believe by eating it, they're sinning and that they're going against their conscience. And so verse 12, their conscience is wounded. And verse 13, you have caused that brother or sister to stumble in their faith. And so in conclusion, here's the principle, verse 9. We're to take care that this right or freedom of ours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Now let me illustrate this with a more, perhaps more relevant, modern example. And it's the whole issue of alcohol. Do Christians, should Christians drink alcohol or not? As I was preparing this sermon, I, I um, listened to a pastor in Glasgow who um, spoke about his own experience. Now, you probably know that Glasgow is um, beset with drug and alcohol problems. And this pastor was explaining that he had come to the, the decision as a pastor in Glasgow that he would not touch a drop of alcohol. And that wasn't because of his knowledge of the Bible. He knew from his knowledge of the Bible that he had freedom to drink alcohol in moderation. There's no blanket ban in the Bible in terms of drinking alcohol. But he chose with prayer and with care not to exercise that freedom because of his situation in Glasgow. He knew that if he did drink alcohol, it could become a stumbling block to a brother or a sister in his church who was still um, facing an ongoing battle with alcohol. Or he knew it could hinder someone from coming to Christ who had been caught up in a culture of alcohol or drug abuse. And so he chose not to drink alcohol while he was in Glasgow. Now, can you see that if that pastor had acted purely on his knowledge of what the Bible taught, he could have ended up harming others spiritually. If he'd said, I know the Bible, I know the Bible gives me freedom to drink, and so I will drink. Can you see that that could actually have caused problems for others, caused others to stumble. Knowledge on its own puffs up. On its own, it makes us proud and it can hurt others. And so let's move secondly to see that love builds up. It's good to have knowledge, just not on its own. Knowledge must be tempered with love. 
knowledge on its own tells us it's fine to eat, it's fine to drink. But love tells us, no, it's not fine. For the sake of my brother or sister, I won't eat or drink on this occasion. I will give up my right, my freedom for their sake. So it's good to increase in knowledge. It's good to increase in spiritual understanding. But consider this, what is my concern as I increase in knowledge? What is my goal? Is my concern to build up my own ego, to increase the applause of others towards me? Or is my concern to build, build God's kingdom and give God the glory? The person with a big head but a small heart can be a terrible menace in the kingdom of God. So aim to have your heart bigger than your head, if I can put it like that. Aim to have more love in your heart then you have knowledge in your head. Don't let your knowledge outgrow your love, but let your love outgrow your knowledge, if anything. Just think for a moment about teachers that you've had at school or in college, or pastors that you've had in churches down the years. Think about which ones have impacted you the most. Which ones immediately come to your mind? Which ones do you remember with the greatest affection? Now, they are probably not the ones with the most knowledge, probably not the ones even who taught with the greatest skill and passion. Rather, they're probably the ones who cared about you the most. They were there not just to impart knowledge, but they were there to love you and to care for you as a person. Look at verse 2. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. Think about these statements that are related to that one. Ignorance does not know that it does not know. True knowledge does not know and it knows it. Or this, knowledge is passing from the unconscious state of ignorance to the conscious state of ignorance. Or the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Isn't that true? The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. In other words, our knowledge is really very, very limited. Even if you're the greatest professor, the greatest Bible scholar in the world, you really don't know very much at all. Now, here's the key thing, verse 3. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. In other words, what Paul is saying is that true knowledge is not about abstract facts and information. It's about personal relationships. Real knowledge knows that love is superior. Real knowledge is in the heart, not just in the head. We've got a saying that knowledge is power. And so people seek knowledge so that they can influence others, so that they can coerce get what they want. But you see, love doesn't work like that. 
I think it's so interesting in this passage that Paul does not say, uh, does not use his knowledge to try to persuade the weaker brother here. It's not that he doesn't do that. Of course, he does teach. He does want people to grow in knowledge. But his concern in this instance is not to try to persuade the weaker brother or sister to his point of view. Rather, we're to point, we're to put our point of view to one side, as it were. Even though we know we're right, and we're to exercise love in the situation through our weaker brother or sister. So do you see, we are not to call the weak to adjust their position to ours. We are to adjust our position to their, to them in love. So real freedom is not freedom to do what I want. It's not even freedom to do what I know I can do. Real freedom is freedom to love others. Real freedom is to be free from my own self-centered arrogance. It is freedom to consider the interests of others more than I consider my own interests. And it's only as we live in this freedom, it's only when we love that we will grow in Christ and we will help others grow in Christ. Love builds up. So if you think about the Bible, there are some things the Bible is clear that we are to embrace. And there are some things the Bible is clear that we need to get rid of and not tolerate. But there are many, many things that the Bible says nothing about, or practically nothing about, or even if it does say stuff about it, it's often not incredibly clear so that Christians end up not sure or disagreeing on things. And what's so sad is that it's these things, these disputable things that Christians can get all het up about and divide over. So, nitty gritty, should I wear a mask or not? Should I distance myself from others or not? Should I get the vaccine or not? The Bible does not tell us. There is no clear yes or no. But what is clear is this principle that knowledge puffs up, love builds up. And we are each, as individuals, called to pray and to apply that principle with the greatest of care in all the different situations we are in. Whether we walk into a shop or into church or into a family situation, the answer is probably going to be different in different situations according to whom we're mixing with. And so consider this. In my exercise of freedom, do I bring others closer to God? In my exercise of freedom, do I strengthen the faith of others? In my exercise of freedom, am I promoting the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace? And in my exercise of freedom, are my fellow believers glad that they know me? Let's pray together.